Proverbs chapter 23. I'm going to get right to it because it's going to take a miracle for me to finish this message. <laughs> Proverbs chapter number 23. And uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful now to have this opportunity once again to gather around your word. And Lord, I just pray that your spirit would use your word in our hearts and lives as we hear it and believe it and consider it, receive it. Thank you for the messages that have gone forth, and I pray you'll bless uh, in this hour and the next as we finish up. It's just been a blessing, Lord, to fellowship with your people, and we're thankful for all we have in Christ, and we want to give you all honor and glory and ask you, to, again, to bless our time together in your holy name. Amen. All right, Proverbs chapter 23, and I'm going to try, and that's the key word, try to finish the message I started Friday night. I'm going to give it the old college try. You know, I've been preaching 25 years, that's hard to believe, and I've never learned how to do it. <laughs> but uh, maybe one day we'll figure out the clock and all that stuff. I took a course in college called homiletics. I don't even know what it meant, but I think it was supposed to help you learn how to do these things. But uh, Proverbs 23 and verse 23, buy the truth and sell it not, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. And as I said last time, you look at the first part of the verse, it's just seven simple one-syllable words, and yet how deep it is. It's amazing how much God can put in so few words. It conveys a life-changing principle to those who follow it. Uh, those who are wise seek to personally possess the truth at any cost. And then once they have it, they will not part with it for any Cause. That's the basic idea here. And there is a big difference, as we've already said, just reminding you a little bit here, a little review. There's a big difference between just mentally assenting to truth that you've heard from others and personally buying the truth. There's a difference. If you just take what you hear, and it's not real to you, it won't take much for you to leave it. But when you buy it, it's valuable. You realize the value of it and you'll hold on to it. And so to buy the truth means it is dwelling deeply within our heart so that it actually forms who we are. It's to be fully persuaded that uh, what God said is true. And it's to have real conviction about what you believe. And so in the first message, we emphasize the importance of, uh, of the truth as revealed in God's word, the importance and the value of it. But I want to start out this morning by saying it's not enough to believe we have the word of truth. That's where it starts. You've got to have the right foundation to know you have the word of God. In 2 Timothy 3.16, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All 66 books, every word of them, it's given by inspiration of God, meaning it's the living words of God. The Spirit of God gave the words through men, and they are... As it is in truth, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, the word of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So, you know, that's foundational. You've got to really believe you have God's words, but you don't stop there. That's where you start. Once you know you have his word, you need to learn to study it the way he told you. It being the word of God, it's not to be approached like any other book. God tells you within His Word how to approach His Word, how to study His Word, and there are keys within the book itself so that if you follow those keys, the Bible interprets itself to you. It's the living Word of God. We don't have any right or place to come to this book and have our own interpretation. It, uh, interpretations belong to God, Joseph said way back in the book of Genesis. And so this is God's Word. He interprets it by His Spirit uh, through the word itself, as we follow those rules that he gave us, like comparing spiritual things with spiritual, 1 Corinthians 2, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. We know that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, it being of divine origin, it must have a divine interpretation. And, uh, and so one of the major keys, of course, is 2 Timothy 2.15, in the one verse where God tells us to study his word, he tells us exactly how. You might be familiar with this verse, but we're going to look at it anyway. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself. So nobody can do this for you. This is personal. And here's the right motive. Approved unto God. Not approved unto the grace movement. 
not approved unto the Baptist church, not approved unto whoever you want to name, your family, your friends, or whoever, but approved unto God. We fear God. We put Him first. It's, it, it's Bible study is about a relationship with God. And uh, we want to serve Him and know His will. So it starts with knowing we have His Word, but then where are we living in God's plan for the ages? What are we to be doing in this present age so that we can serve Him in a way that He approves and that He will reward one day at the judgment seat of Christ? A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Implication is it's possible to serve God in such a way that one day you will be ashamed. Not all service is good service that God will reward. It's about the quality of the work, not just the quantity. <laughs> and uh, you, you got to do it according to his word, by his spirit, with the right motive. All of this, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And here's how you're going to, the whole Bible is the word of truth, but if you're going to understand it and teach it correctly, and um, you know, know the truth of God's word for where you're living, you must rightly divide the word of truth. That's the key, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, only the King James Bible gives you that key. <laughs> That's enough right there to show you the, that the modern versions um, have a satanic influence. You, the devil does not want you understanding the word of God. So it makes sense that he would attack the very key to understanding the word of God. And all the new versions mess up this verse. All of them. Only the King James Bible gives you the key to understanding the word. So that's proof right there. This is the word of God. Now, it's not enough. It's not enough to be biblical. You have to be dispensational. Okay? And so, you know, the Sabbath day is biblical. Keep the Sabbath. Isn't that what the scripture says? Yet, as you study the word, you find out that's a sign between God and Israel, and we're not Israel. And so Paul repeated nine out of the Ten Commandments in his epistles. But uh, concerning the Sabbath, he said, let no man judge you in these Sabbath days. So we're not under the Sabbath. God never changed the Sabbath to Sunday, and he never put the body of Christ under the Sabbath or any other holy day, because we're not under the law. We're under grace, as it clearly says in Romans 6. So... Uh, tongues, speaking an unknown tongue, that's biblical. Tongues are in the Bible. Why don't we speak with tongues? There's a dispensational reason. When you understand what they were given for and what that's all about and that they have ceased, there's a lot of people out there that are biblical, they're not dispensational, and that's why there's so much confusion. All false teachers use the Bible, they just use it out of context you got to understand where you're living in God's plan for the ages and understand where you're at and what he would have you to do because not whereas all the Bible's for you, it certainly was not all written directly to you. And if you think it is, it'll just confuse you. You can't possibly follow everything it says. There are things this Bible says that if you were to follow, you'd be out of the will of God today. You know, bring the sacrifice to the temple. <laughs> try that. There's not even temple over there. And if you were to try to do that, that you would be out of the will of God. That's not in light of where we're at and what Christ has accomplished through his cross. It would be the wrong thing to do today. If you were to try to go about building an ark, first of all, you've got to figure out what gopher wood is. That'll take a while. And then you've got to figure out what a cubit is. And on it goes. And if you were to do that, it'd be a big, fat waste of time. Because God's not sending another global flood like he did in Noah's day. The next time he brings uh, that catastrophic judgment, it's going to be by fire. And the ark ain't going to protect anybody from that. So you got to understand these things. And I know you all know this. I'm just kind of reminding you a little bit about the importance of these things. And, so it, and, and as I, I often say and others say, and it's so true, rightly dividing the word of truth is not an issue of dividing truth from error. Because it says rightly dividing the word of truth. There's no error in the word of truth. In the word of truth, though, there are some divisions that God who wrote the book put those divisions in there, and you've got to acknowledge those divisions and be consistent with maintaining those divisions in your Bible study, or you're going to get into some error. <laughs> See, God does not change in who He is. He does not change in His moral principles. He doesn't change in the promises He makes. And so uh, we know that all Scripture is for us. 
all of it's for us. But again, he does change in his dealings with man as he progressively has revealed more truth. Dispensational truth is a progressive unfolding of divine revelation. Now it's all completed. We have it all. But when you're going through the Bible, you have to understand that God has made some changes along the way. Now, again, there are things that never change, but there are things that do. And this is where people get messed up. This is where they get confused. They won't acknowledge these differences. And so, you know, the main division, once you see that, I, I, it's just an issue of following it through and things begin to fall into place more and more. And the main division of the Bible is implied in the very first verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Well, God has a purpose for heaven and earth. Does anybody think heaven and earth is the same thing? You understand there's a, a difference between heaven and earth. And by the way, in your first chapter of Genesis 1, look at all the things God divides. See, we live in a time now in our society where people think that division is automatically bad. No, there's some good divisions. <laughs> and God does some dividing. What God hath divided, let no man join together. <laughs> And so you understand how this works. Now let's compare. I know you've seen this a lot, but it's, I always enjoy looking at it because I remember like it was yesterday when, it, when this it was like a, a floodlight came on in my understanding about the Word of God, and that's Acts 3 and Romans 16. And the, comparing these two passages. Because I, I was looking at Acts, early Acts, and I'm thinking, if this is about us, how come we're not doing any of this? You know? You know, on the baptistry wall, it says, they that gladly received his word were baptized. Not our, we don't have baptistry. I'm, I'm pointing to an imaginary baptistry wall. I've seen churches, and I was in one that has, has that. Well, what about all the other stuff in the passage, like sell all things you have, have all things common, and speak with other tongues, and on and on and on? People go in there, and they pick and choose, and they're not consistent. And so I was thinking, what is missing here? Something's missing. And there are people, by the way, that are dispensational to an extent as far as the Schofield Bible will take them, as far as the Ruckman commentary will take them, and then they'll stop with that. But you've got to follow it through. And you've got to follow it through and let it take you where it leads you. And, and, and if you can rightly divide, you can wrongly divide. People in, ignore God's divisions or they invent some that are not there. <laughs> They're under or over, rightly dividing when you see this main division and follow it through, you're on your way to understanding more and more. That's why Paul said, consider what I say. And the Lord give the understanding in all things. The Lord has to give you that understanding and he's going to use the Apostle Paul to help you in this age of grace to understand the word of God because what Paul wrote was the word of God and he was writing directly to us. So in Acts 3.19, here's Peter standing up, preaching to Israel. And there's no doubt he's preaching to Israel because he says in the passage, ye men of Israel. Okay, Verse 19, repent ye. Now who's ye? That's not a trick question. I already gave you the answer. <laughs> ye men of Israel. He's, he's preaching the cross as a murder indictment. You've killed your Messiah. Bad news. The good news is he's raised from the dead and he'll come back if you repent of what you've done and receive him as your king. He'll come back and set up his kingdom. That's not our message in this age. But Peter's preaching, repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That's the second coming when Israel saved under the new covenant as a nation. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which was before, uh, before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And so the main division is between prophecy concerning God's earthly people, Israel, and the mystery of his heavenly people, the body of Christ. In Romans 16, 25, Paul wrote, Now to him there is a power to establish you according to my gospel. And he says my gospel because he received it by revelation of Jesus Christ. In Galatians 1, 11 and 12. And the preaching of Jesus Christ. Now, was Peter preaching Christ in the early Acts? Certainly he was, but according to what? Prophecy. What's Paul saying here? 
The preaching of Jesus Christ according to Revelation, the mystery. Peter said he's raised from the dead to sit on the throne of his father David. He's the king of Israel. He's going to rule and reign on this earth. But Paul preached Christ is risen to be the head of one new man, a spiritual body seated with Christ in heavenly places. You see, Israel continued to reject as a nation their Messiah, and they fall at the stoning of Stephen in that great crisis when they blasphemed the Holy Ghost, nationally speaking. And God, be, God then moves away from them in a transition, but he raises up Paul, reveals the message of this age, reveals what he planned before the world began, but had kept secret. It's not an afterthought. It's not a plan B. He knew exactly what he was going to do. But when Israel falls, then he reveals this mystery concerning what he's going to do building the church, the body of Christ. And, of course, there's so much that goes into all of this, and it's so wonderful to see these things and understand the differences here. I mean, it's all, there's one family of God when it's all said and done in eternity, rede redeemed by the blood of Christ. But there's a difference in the family of God between Israel and Gentile nations and the body of Christ. That's three different groups with three different spheres of blessing in eternity with a new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. These differences matter. I mean, Stephen said, I see the Son of Man standing. When they were going to stone him to death, everything was ripe and ready for God to pour out wrath. Sit on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool, Psalm 110. He could have brought wrath and judgment. Instead, he poured out grace, taking that very leader in the rebellion against him, Saul of Tarsus, saving him by, as Paul put it, exceeding abundant grace, revealing his the, the gospel of the grace of God to him and the mystery of the body of Christ and all those wonderful things that go along with that mystery and ushering in this present age, which put prophecy on hold. It's not been canceled. It's just been interrupted. It's been postponed. It will be fulfilled when this age ends with the mystery of our catching away to meet Christ in the air. But he said... The revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets and we still need the whole Bible according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. But I, when I saw those words and again I didn't get this from a man I got it by looking at my Bible and I said now if there's something that's spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began and then there's something that's kept secret since the world began that cannot be the same thing. It just cannot be. It's impossible. People say, well, that's your interpretation. I don't have an interpretation. I believe what it says. And if it doesn't mean what it says, what are we even doing here? You can't argue with it. Facts are stubborn things. Okay? And so I'm not glorifying Paul. He's the chief of sinners saved by grace. Paul said, I'm less than the least of all saints. But he said, this grace was given unto me. And if you, look, when the Lord sends a man to you with his words, you better acknowledge that. Yeah. People are always trying to diminish Paul, always trying to regulate him away when he said, I magnify mine office. He didn't magnify himself. It was the office the Lord gave him. It was the Lord speaking through him, and there is a difference. Right. Now, go to 1 Timothy 4, if you would, please. 1 Timothy 4, see, what was truth for Israel under the law? may not be the truth for the body of Christ under grace. And that's why it's not enough just to say we have the word of truth. Because it's possible to have the word of truth and still teach false doctrine. Because you don't know how to handle the word of truth. Because you're not rightly dividing the word of truth. In 1 Timothy chapter number 4, in verse number 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that's in plain, direct, urgent terms. That in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. And we're going to look at what that faith is in just a moment. It's at the end of chapter 3. It's got to do with the body of Christ. They're going to depart from it. Why? Given heed to seducing spirits. You see, the spirit speaketh expressly. How's the devil speak? Yea, hath God said something good's about to happen to you. Very smooth and positive, good words and fair speeches. Paul warned about Romans 16. How about Colossians 2, 4, enticing words? Seducing spirits, trying to draw you away from the plain truth. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. What are you talking about, the Ouija board? Now, I don't like that. That thing creeps me out. I don't want to be around a Ouija board and throw that thing out the window if somebody brings one of those things out. 
But, but that's not what he, what is he talking about. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. See, God's preachers preach the truth in sincerity, but Satan's ministers speak lies and hypocrisy. And uh, forbidding to marry. You know, in God's church, he said a bishop must be the husband of one wife. That's a qualification. And God wasn't kidding around when he said that either, by the way. And so the husband of one, uh, of one wife, and yet in Satan's church, he forbids to marry. So that tells you about the Catholic. It's Satan's church. That's part of that mystery of iniquity. Now, it's not the mother harlot because uh, the Catholic church is not old enough for that, but she's definitely a daughter <laughs> of the great whore. It's a sad thing to see people blinded by that false religion. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the what? You believe and know the truth? Well, what is the truth? Isn't the truth, Adam, you can't eat meat. I've given you the herb of the field and the, tr the trees of the garden. That's what you eat, Adam. Isn't that the truth? What about Noah, where God says after the flood, now you can eat meat. Noah, just don't eat it rare, please. <laughs> can't have it with blood. That's the truth. What about with Moses? Didn't God say, now here's what you can eat and here's what you can eat. These meats over here are unclean. All right? Your pork is unclean. Your scrimps are unclean. All that stuff is unclean. There are certain things that are unclean. Isn't that the truth? There are people right now preaching today. Well, down the road here, we got a church called Mount Sinai, Seventh-day Adventist Church. They're stuck on Mount Sinai. I think they have the law, and they're trying to abstain from meats and keep holy days. That's sad. But they're not rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, Paul said right here uh, in verse 4, every creature of God is good. I always feel something when I read that. Just the Lord touches my heart. <laughs> Nothing to be refused. You won't find me refusing anything to eat. <laughs> If it be received with thanksgiving, for it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. God said, Israel, these meats are unclean to you. Now God said to us, you can eat whatever you want. What makes something clean or unclean is what God says. God gave the truth. He said, Israel, there's a reason I want you to follow this. He, and he had very good reason for all of that, but he gave him a dietary law. But he didn't put us under that dietary law. All right, so if you know the truth, people say, well, I just take the whole Bible. I just follow the whole Bible. Well, then what are you going to eat today? Are you going to be like Adam and be a vegetarian? Are you going to be like Noah and have some meat? Are you going to be like Moses and avoid certain meats? Are you going to be like what Paul said, eat whatever you want? You can't follow all four at the same time. And that's just a simple thing. And you all know this, but I'm just reminding you, that proves right there. You must rightly divide the word of truth. Now, here's the scary thing. See, Satan doesn't want you to believe you have the word of God. But if you believe you have it, that's not, he's not done with you. He said, okay, let me tell you what the Bible says. He'll quote scripture to you. He said, let's have a Bible study. He don't mind if you read your Bible as long as you don't understand it. If he can't get you to deny the inspiration, he'll work on you concerning interpretation. He said, you know, you shouldn't eat certain meats. Isn't that what the Bible says? So today, if someone says you're not right with God based on what you eat or don't eat, that has now become a doctrine of devils because the devil will use Scripture out of context. That's his modus operandi, whatever that means, okay? <laughs> That's how he works. That's what he'll do. He'll add to the Word. He'll diminish from the Word. He'll try to change the Word. But if, you, if you're going to say, no, I'm a Bible believer, I'm not falling for that, you say, okay, okay, believe all the words, let's just, start, let's just mix them all up then, so you don't understand the words. Now, I know some guys that are staunch King James Bible believers, but when it comes to this issue, they've missed the boat, and they're therefore teaching some wrong things, even though they believe the Word of God. You've got to believe the book, but you also got to rightly divide the book. You see... The church must be all about the truth. Look back in chapter 3, 1 Timothy 3, 14. And by the way, when we're going to be doing the work of the ministry, trying to edify the body of Christ, didn't Paul say in Ephesians 4, 15, we are speaking the truth in love. 
Speaking the what? The truth. It's all about the truth. 1 Timothy 3, 14. These things ride unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. And that behavior has been described leading up to this in this chapter when he gives qualifications for bishops and deacons that describes godliness. That's the proper behavior in the house of God. Which is the church of the living God. The pillar and ground of the what? Here it is again. Now, we believe the whole Bible is the truth, but we must rightly divide the word of truth and the pillar and ground of the truth, what truth in particular, what is he dealing with? He goes on to say, and, so the thought's not finished yet, without controversy, great is the mystery of the incarnation. No, he says the mystery of godliness, the theme, the subject, the context is godliness. How can a sinner like me be godly? It's not by my religious efforts. It's not by for being forbidden to marry and abstain from meats. <laughs> That's the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of iniquity is Satan's religious system that when you boil it down, it's designed to get you to put your confidence in the flesh. The mystery of godliness is that sinners like us are made godly by a spiritual union with Jesus Christ. I'm godly through Him. In other words, if God lives in me and lives His life through me, that's what you call godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached on the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now that verse definitely applies to Jesus Christ personally. Everything said there applies to Him personally. But if it's only about Him personally, why is it out of order? And I don't have time to do a whole study on this. I've taught on this before. But there's, the order here matches the body of Christ, the church. People fight about this verse. They say, is it talking about Christ or His church? Both. And that's the point. Because Christ and His church are one. How's God going to be manifest in this world in this age? It's, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That he's going to live his life through us. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, he's being made manifest that the life of Christ is made manifest in our mortal bodies. Now our flesh, we understand, is you know, corrupt and we're, we reckon it dead. But I'm just saying in this body as we, as we live, it's, it's got to be by we're dead unto sin, alive unto God. God living his life through us. But I'm not going to run all those references because... We've got so much else to look at this morning. And again, we've taught on these matters. But you have at the end of chapter 3 the mystery of godliness of what God is doing in this age, building the body of Christ, that Christ and His church are one, and we're made godly by our spiritual union with Him. Well, guess what? The Spirit speaketh expressly. He's warning that that's what people are departing from. And, and when you come into chapter 4, what's He describing? The mystery of iniquity. And Brother Drew was teaching on that last night, did a great job warning us once again how we need to take heed to that warning that there is a mystery of iniquity, which is Satan's religious system that's been working going all the way back to Cain, coming up through history. It's working now. It's going to culminate under the Antichrist in the future, but it's a very real thing. And boy, it looks so appealing to people. And people like legalism because they want to, they're arrogant, they're self-righteous. It appeals to them that they can perform. You have the out-and-out -out legalism of being justified by works, which is ridiculous. But then there are some churches that say you're justified by faith, but you can't live the Christian life without your performance. Both are forms of legalism. Study Galatians about that. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? As you've received Christ Jesus, the Lord, Colossians 2 says, so walk ye in Him. You received Him by faith. You walk by faith. It's putting your confidence in Him and Him alone. But this idea that I can be made godly by my discipline and my performance and, my, and, and what I can do in the flesh. No, he's warning against that. He's saying there are going to be people departing from the faith. And that faith, by the way, in 1 Timothy 3, verse number um, 9, he talked about the deacons holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. So... Paul said there's one faith in Ephesians 4, a, a, a body of doctrine that Christ from heaven revealed through him for the body of Christ. It's the mystery of the faith. 
Now, again, the whole Bible is the word of truth. And I don't want to do away with any of it. I don't want to add to it. I don't want to diminish from it. But God told me to divide it. Okay, that's what God said to do to his word. And see those differences. And so there's people departing from the faith. They're, they're departing from the truth. And that's, that's the warning we, that we're given here. You see, we must be all about the truth of God, not the traditions of men. Jesus Christ said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. John 4, 24. But what's going on today? I mean, it's been a problem down through church history, but the issue is many worship God in vain. Why? Because they teach for doctrines the commandments of men. The Lord said over there in Matthew uh, chapter number 5, or 15 rather, you know what he said about warning about traditions that the, the Pharisees were adding to the Word of God, man-made traditions that they were elevating as though they were authoritative like the Word of God. He said in Matthew 15 verse 7, <clears throat> You hypocrites, sweet Jesus. Never said an unkind word to anybody. Well, did Isaiah's prophecy, prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, but in vain they do worship me. There is such a thing as vain worship. Paul talked about ignorant worship. In Acts 17, him you ignorantly worship, I'll declare him unto you. You're worshiping the unknown God. And he was talking to people who had devotions too. <laughs> Read it in Acts 17. He said, In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You see, if you get to keeping the commandments of men and the traditions of men, you know what that's going to do? It's going to cause you to turn from the truth. In Titus 1.14, he talked about the commandments of men that turn from the truth. And so many in their zeal to keep their religious traditions end up rejecting the Word of God. And you show them something in the Word of God and they say, well, that's not what I always heard. That's not what I've been told and that can't be right. So I better go online and find you know, an article or a sermon against that so I can refute it. All right. Mark 7 verse 9, he said unto them, full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition." They were offended at Christ for teaching the truth. Well, great peace have they which love thy law. Nothing shall offend them. Psalm 119, 165. So if they were offended at what he was saying, what does that prove? It proved they didn't love the law of God. They loved the traditions of men. Oh, that, that crowd is still around today, aren't they? And so what happens is Satan blinds people to the truth through his religious system. In John chapter 8, this is a, now I'd like to read the whole chapter. It's fascinating, but I just want to give you a little bit out of it in John chapter 8, verse number 43. Jesus telling these unbelieving Jews, Why do you not understand my speech? He said, Read my lips. No new taxes. <laughs> I'd love for somebody to say that and mean it. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. That's a scary thing. You want to know they could not? Because they didn't want to. They first were rejecting it, and therefore they would not hear it, and they could not hear it. You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. Because there's no truth in him. Talking about Satan, of course. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar. And the father of it. In contrast, Jesus said, I am the truth. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not? Which of you convinceth me of sin? Now, what mere man could make a statement like that to his enemies? You know, if I stood up here this morning and said, which of you convinceth me of sin? My family right here would say, well, he could. <laughs> but Jesus could say that because he was without sin. And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Not just thoughts or doctrines. Words. 
Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. And the politicians say, we're all God's children. I'll go with Jesus Christ on that one. He said, you're of your father, the devil. You, you can't hear my words because you're not of God. And how the Jews respond, you know. They said, say we not well thou art Samaritan, that's a devil. <laughs> Isn't that what people do? You try to show them something, right? And they get all mad and offended. And they say, well, you're a hyper dispensationalist. You have a devil. <laughs> Just start calling names, you know. What about the content of what we're dealing with here? Can we discuss this? I had a, a preacher in this area. We sat down for lunch, and he started on right away. said, I didn't know you were a hyper-dispensationalist. And I said, well, what makes you call me that? He said, because you believe there's more than one gospel in the Bible. I said, well, can I explain to you why I believe that? And I showed him a few verses, and he totally changed the subject, would not engage on it, just... I mean, you can see the fog come over, and he didn't even care. Why? Because he loves his traditions more than he loves the truth. That's what people do. Guilt by association, name calling. That's people, straw man arguments. That's people who can't deal with the substance. And you just got to move on. I mean, if they, you know, say what you can where you can. If they won't receive it, move on to somebody who will. And so Paul warned about the mystery of iniquity already working. That religious system blinds people to truth. And what people need to do to recover themselves is re repent to the acknowledging of the truth. 2 Timothy 2. they got to personally recover themselves by acknowledging the truth of God's word rightly divided. You know, in 1 John 4, you have that warning about many false prophets are out in the world, and that's, uh, that's, <laughs> that's going to be really rampant in the 70th week, but it, it's bad now. He said in 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they're of God, because many false prophets are going out in the world. And then he said down in verse 6, We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now which one are you operating in? Those who buy the truth have the spirit of truth. I mean, they recognize the truth when they hear it. They love the truth. They want the truth. They don't say, well, what will that cost me if I believe that? What will my friends think? What will the brethren say? Uh, what will, you know, all this stuff, stick your thumb in the air and see which way the wind's blowing and all that kind of stuff, you know. Man, you see a lot of that going on in, in, in with men in, in the pulpit I'm talking about. They're political. They're just political. I, I have some illustrations running through my head, but I can't do it for time's sake. I can give you examples of what I'm talking about. But we're living in the last days of apostasy that Paul warned us about in his last inspired epistle in 2 Timothy. Whereas in 1 Timothy, he said, some shall depart from the faith. You come over to 2 Timothy, he said, they have all forsaken me. And it gets worse and worse, not better and better, because he said... Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 2 Timothy 3.13. What are we to do? Continue in the things we've learned and been assured of. Just because everybody else is going into apostasy doesn't mean we have to. Apostasy is a willful denial and departure from the truth. And just as it was apostasy for Israel to depart from the truth God revealed to them through his spokesman Moses, so it's apostasy in the age of grace for believers to depart from the truth that God revealed to us through his spokesman Paul, which is why he said in 2 Timothy 1.13, Hold fast the form of sound words. And he's telling Timothy, you're facing opposition. You're facing deception. You, it, 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 the persecution is coming, but hold fast. Don't let it go. Hold it firmly. This form of sound words, which is preserved for us in Romans through Philemon, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep. And how are we going to be faithful? Not by our own power, but by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are five jealous and Hermogenes, and they turned away, not from Paul's personality and Paul's opinions, they turned away from the doctrine he was teaching. And he goes on in this letter talking about how now they're turned unto fables. They leave the truth for religious story time. 
you know? And so you have this issue of holding... Now, let me... About the truth, notice in uh, 2 Timothy 2.18, there's a downward spiral away from the truth. He said in 2 Timothy 2.18, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some... Rightly dividing the word of truth is understood by the context. He talks about people who knew the truth of resurrection, but where did they err? They erred by putting it in the wrong place and said it was... They didn't deny there was a resurrection. They just put it in the wrong place. So that's what rightly dividing is. It's an issue of getting things in their proper place in the word of God and seeing those divisions and the differences and whatever. And so uh, they erred concerning the truth. But in chapter 3, verse 8, it says that uh, as, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. And then you get down to chapter 4, verse 4. They shall turn away their ears from the truth. They shall be turned to the fables. They will not endure a sound doctrine, which means they were hearing it and left it. So it begins by erring concerning the truth, and then they begin to resist it when the correction comes. They don't want to hear it, and then they just turn away from it altogether. In days of apostasy, the prophet Isaiah said, truth has fallen in the street. Isaiah 59, 14. Jeremiah said there was none left in Jerusalem that was seeking the truth. In chapter 5, verse 1, he said the truth has perished. In chapter 7, verse 28, and he said there was none that was valiant for the truth. Jeremiah 9, verse 3. I'm talking about days of apostasy in Israel, but the truth is still here. So the, the bottom line is, those things can be said of the world and professing church today, but thankfully God always has a faithful remnant. And even in Jeremiah's day, you know what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 15? He said, O Lord, thou knowest, remember me and visit me and revenge me of my persecutors. Take me not away in thy long suffering. Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. Thy words were found. Even though people were ignoring them and rejecting them. And he said, look, the truth has perished, it seems, among most people. Yet Jeremiah said, thy words were found and I did eat them. If everybody's denying it and everybody's De departing from it, you can personally eat the word of God. And what will happen is thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. God always has his remnant that believe his words. To eat the word of God means more than just you read it for your daily devotional. It means you meditate in it and you, and you believe it and you study it and it becomes part of who you are and you get the nourishment out of it that God has in it for you. You eat the word of God. And it becomes the joy and rejoicing of your heart. And ultimately, the good news is, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 8, we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. You can't defeat the truth. It's all said and done. The word of God endureth forever. All flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of our God shall endure forever. Amen. It's going to march on. The truth goes marching on. <laughs> Was that? No. Lord, forgive me. That was from a blasphemous song. I, where did that? Satan, get thee behind me, Satan. Where did that come from? There's evil spirits in here. We hate that song. Battle, hymn of the Republic, apostasy, blasphemy. The union thought they were bringing in the kingdom, killing our forefathers. All right, enough of that. Isn't that something how that works? Came out of nowhere, man. All right, now I'm finally finished my introduction. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to tell you what I was going to preach and then we're going to close. Okay? <laughs> you know, I could, you could be a whole series. I'm, I'm going to take the next five minutes and just wrap it up here, but I'm not, there's so many things to look at. I'm just going to, we're, I, we're not going to turn to these passages. We're just going to run through them real quick. If you're going to buy the truth, it'll cost you self-righteousness. You study that in Philippians 3. Paul said all his righteousness were as dung. It was, it was, he thought it was gain to him, but he, he realized it was actually lost. It was dung compared to the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. And he said, I want to be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness which is of God by faith. And he said, we have no confidence in the flesh. We worship God in the spirit. And so if you're going to buy the truth, you're going to have to get over yourself. Your, your so-called righteousness and your opinions and your views on everything doesn't matter. You want, to, you want to know what God said, and you want to follow God's word. And so you, it's going to cost you that self-righteousness. It's going to cost you t some time and effort, my friend. 
Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, I appreciate those who watch online, but I always say, and I'm going to remind you, that watching studies and sermons on YouTube is not buying the truth. Bible studies work. It can be a help to you to listen to someone else, but you've got to get in that book for yourself, and the truth of God's word is well worth the effort to learn it. We've got to engage in personal Bible study. Study to show thyself approved unto God. It's got to be real in us. It's going to cost you some religious tradition. Paul talked about he was zealous for the tradition of his fathers. He had to get rid of some things that he was, it was ingrained in him. You know, there are things Christians believe that are just totally rooted in tradition instead of the Word of God. Uh, do you read the Bible looking for proof text to support what you've already been told and what you already accepted? Or do you read the Bible to find out what God wants you to believe? There's a big difference. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. I hear something being preached or taught. I'm going to say, now is that what the scripture says? And I'm going to try to prove it. If I can't prove it, I reject it. If it's what the scripture says, then I'll hold to it. You know, what are baptisms? The first step of obedience. That's what it says in Matthew chapter 30, verse number 17. <laughs> first step of obedience. Uh, you got to be baptized to be right with God. It's the Christian uniform, you know. Uh, it's how you join the church. And all this stuff is total tradition. It's not the truth of the Word of God. And there are people who will not fellowship with you unless you've been put in water the same way they were. And what are they denying? They're denying the sufficiency of one baptism by one spirit and one body. And what are they doing? They're trying to protect their denominational identity. Identity. It's amazing. These, these people, they're so arrogant about their denomination. And every one of them think, we're the ones. We're the ones. It's our group. And they're all divided over things that have to do with the flesh. They're making a fair show in the flesh, right? That's what religion's about. Instead of glorifying God and acknowledging what he's doing, because he's not building one denomination. Every denomination in this world was started by a man, not by God. God's building the body of Christ. That's not a denomination. That's a spiritual uh, organism. That's a spiritual body that only God can build. It'll cost you a reputation. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, they uh, said, Paul, you know, uh, you're mad. Much learning doth make thee mad. He said, I'm not mad. Festus. <laughs> he said, uh, I speak forth the words of truth and soberness. And uh, they said, you know what Paul said? They call it heresy. After the way I worship God, they call it heresy. But I believe all things written. If, you believe, if you're a real Bible believer, the religious, religious world will call you a heretic. That, and look, people will say, they said that about Jesus Christ. They said Christ was mad. They said he was beside himself. They even said he had a devil. So I take it as a badge of honor. I mean, there have been people in this community that have tried to lie about me and slander me and even said I was insane. I said, like, praise the Lord. <laughs> I mean, that, I, I must be on the right track somewhere. And by the grace of God, we went through a pretty rough time where there was a lot of lies being told. And yet, after almost 20 years now, you start riding that storm out. You don't run from it. You go through it. And now it's starting to finally turn where some of those same people are saying, well, that man is teaching the Bible. You know, if you want to hear the word, you better go over there. I had somebody that left the church send somebody to visit us recently. They said, well, I don't go there for various reasons, but he is teaching the truth. <laughs> I go to this church because they have stuff for the kids, you know. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. But it finally it's starting to turn where people say, well, the guy's been there a long time preaching the King James Bible, so that is a Bible-believing church. They do believe in rightly dividing the word of truth. And, but whatever. I mean, there's going to be some things you're going to have to deal with. You just keep going. It can cost you some relationships. Oh, Lord talked about, I didn't come to, you know, he said, um, you think I came to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. Luke 12, boy, there's a lot there to consider. I'm not going to get into all that. But he talked about even in families there would be some division over the truth. And Paul said, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Galatians 4, 16. You quickly learn. When you start getting the truth and you get excited about it, you go out and try to share it with somebody, you're going to find out real quick not everybody cares about the truth. And they're going to begin to oppose you on that. And you'll become some people's enemy because of the truth. So it may cost you some relationships. It'll cost you a life of ease. I can promise you that. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2, 9, uh, I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even under bonds. The word of God is not bound. They, they said Paul was a, an evildoer. That's like old sorry Ahab 
when he saw Elijah, he said, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? He had it backwards. I mean, Ahab was the problem. That's how messed up people can be in their thinking. And if you know and stand for the truth, you're going to engage in spiritual battle because the first piece of the whole armor of God is having your loins girt about with what? Truth. <laughs> and uh, J.C. O'Hare said many years ago, he said, if you're not in trouble, it's because you're not in the ministry. <laughs> I mean, in other words, he's saying, you're gun it just comes with the territory. It's not Serving God is not the path of least resistance. It could cost you even your life. Galatians 6.17, Paul talked about, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. And he said, I am ready to be offered. 2 Timothy 4, he said, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. He knew there was a crown laid up for him. He had been faithful all the way through. It cost Paul his very life. He was a martyr for Jesus Christ. Down throughout uh, church history, those who have bought the truth face persecution and even death from the religious world. And things are heating up here in America in these days. You better buy the truth and sell it not. See, you kind of come to a crossroads. It never fails. I've seen it where you start getting the truth, and then there comes a test. Now, how far are you going with this? And I know some, I know some preachers that got excited when we started talking about some of these things about understanding the Word of God. Ah, but that makes sense. That, that answers so many questions. But then you see the wheels turning. Now, wait uh... It's going to mess up a lot of my sermons. I won't be able to just take the Bible and do what I want with it. I'm going to have to actually study it in context. And, you know, I mean, they start, and, and then what are, the, what are the brethren going to say? And they, they aren't willing to pay a price. But it's well worth it. It's well worth it to buy the truth and sell it not. It's well worth it. I'm telling you, don't sell it for any price, ever. Sell it not, period. Judas sold the truth, literally. Jesus Christ says the truth, and he sold them out for 30 pieces of silver. Where did it get him? Now, I know he was a devil. I understand that. But there are believers today who will sell out the truth. You can't lose salvation if you're in the body of Christ, but you can lose a lot. And I'm going to finish with 2 Timothy 2, verse number 10. And we'll finish here. I'm still not done with the message. <laughs> Hey, I was going to tell you this. I was going to tell you that some people sell the truth because they're trying to have peace with others. When the Bible said the wisdom of God's first pure, then peaceable. Paul said as much as lie, then you live peaceably with all men. If it's possible, it's not always possible. Never sell out God's word to make peace with others. Put God first, not man. Don't compromise the truth. People want popularity. Jesus talked about... It says in John 12 about those Pharisees that had believed on Christ, but they didn't want to confess Him openly because why? They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And they, they were fearing they'd be put out of the synagogue. You need to, people talk about the right hand of fellowship. It's sometimes, I mean, if you're a real Bible believer, you're going to wind up getting the left foot of disfellowship. You're going to be put out of the, the religious synagogues. It's all right. I love freedom. I don't want to be in your stinking synagogue. <laughs> And uh, the truth is never popular. People will sell out the truth to be popular. Paul wasn't popular. He said he was the filth and offscouring of all things in the world's eyes. He said, we're a spectacle of this world. They do it for prosperity. There's money to be made in religion. Paul talked about he profited in the Jews' religion. He was a wealthy man. But he bought the truth, and it cost him. It cost him a lot of things, and it cost him, you know, they're... <laughs> Oh, there's so much to say. You know, real Bible believers are not tied to any religious system. We're not trying to climb the religious corporate ladder. We just want to be faithful to the truth. But one preacher said to another who started learning right division, he warned him, he said, Sir, a man can't make a living in his denomination if he doesn't hold to the traditions of his denomination. 2 Timothy 2, we're done. 2 Timothy 2.10. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes. That's the body of Christ he's talking about there. Those, you're elect in Christ. You're not elect till you believe on Him. When, when you're in Him, you're elect in Him. That they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He's not talking about justification. They're already justified. He's talking about their glorification. And he said, you want to have a glorification with eternal glory? He said, I'm enduring to get this truth to you so that you can know it and follow it so you will have 
a good presentation at the judgment seat of Christ is what he's talking about. It's a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Praise the Lord. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Deny us in what and how we reign with him? You'll suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. You can't lose your salvation if you sell out the truth, but you're going to suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. You're not going to reign with Christ. In the, in the same way, a faithful man who was faithful to the mysteries of God. And, and see so what happens is people sell the truth to, to get out of trouble, to avoid problems. And they put man before God and, and they compromise and they say, well, it seems to be working. It ain't going to work in that day when you stand before the Lord. The question comes, do you fear God or man? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but if you fear man, it brings a snare. And so you have to realize he will deny you in that day, not in the sense of salvation. Look, in the next verse, he said, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. He won't deny you as a member of his body, but he will deny you in how you reign with him. And you say, well, that doesn't really matter to me as long as I'm, as long as I'm in heaven. You know, that will not, when you stand before your Savior who bled and died for you, and he went all the way to the cross and gave himself fully and sacrificed himself to accomplish your redemption, and then you weren't willing to take a little flack, and you weren't willing to take a little trouble. I mean, folks, you think, I mean, it's going to get real bad real quick in this country. When you look at what happened in 2020, how people were such cowards over nothing. What's going to happen when it really heats up? You better get ready. This say, hey, we're living for eternity. we got to stand before God. This is not like Eric was singing. It's a battlefield, not a recreation room. The church is supposed to be a training ground for soldiers of Jesus Christ to fight the good fight of faith and endure hardness. And so it's going to cost us something eventually. But I'm going to tell you, in that day when you stand before the Lord, it'll be well worth it to know you were faithful. And it's only by His power and it's only for His glory. It's not through you, it's through Him. But He is glorified through the faithfulness of His people. And He will reward you eternally in how you reign with Him. It's going to matter for eternity if you're faithful. And there's so much more I want to say, but I'm going to stop with that. Buy the truth and sell it not. Our Father in Heaven, thank you for the Word of God, that we have the Word of Truth. And then you've shown us... Not only that we have it, but how to understand it. And we need to keep learning and growing because we'll never learn it all in this life. But Lord, I see where people take these things too lightly and they seem to compromise and depart. And there's so many cold Christians out there who are not faithful. Help us. I'm thankful for the people here. I'm preaching to the choir, I realize, with folks that are faithful. But yet, we still have this flesh. We can quickly stray if we're not careful. Help us to be mindful of these things and live by this proverb and to truly buy the truth for ourselves and never sell it out for any reason. Nothing more valuable than the truth of your holy word, and we give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to take a break.
Looking forward now to having Brother Elrod finish out the meeting, and he's a good friend from Calhoun, Georgia, and I've always enjoyed going up there and being with uh, his family and church. Um, I've been able to do that past several years, and uh, you know he's got a great uh, church up there and ministry, and thankful for uh, how the Lord's using him. And um, it's uh, he preached a tremendous message yesterday. Hopefully he won't flop today as we try to, <laughs> it'll be good. It's all about the Word of God. I kid around about those things. Hey, the Word of God, you just give it and God will use it. And I know he'll do that. So appreciate so much in making the trip down here. I guess your brother's covering for you up there. He's not like Absalom now. Is he going to win the hearts of the people? I don't want to get you all worried before. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> Glad to have you, Brother Elrod. Thanks for coming. All right. And boy, them boys are, you got them trained good down there now in the front yeah. row, behaving themselves. Yeah, don't jinx. Look at his look. He's like. <laughs> Amen. Appreciate it. Amen. Good morning. If you would take the word of God and be finding Ezekiel chapter 14 in one hand and also find 2 Timothy chapter 3 and the other, let me say it has been a privilege again to be here with you this weekend and uh, receive the, the gift basket and the cards and food and generous love offering and the hotel, everything has just been first class and from the bottom of my heart I really do appreciate it. Um, I hate that my wife and uh, my youngest couldn't be here today, but it's kind of a special thing to, to have uh, my two oldest boys, we got to spend some time together. We don't really get to do stuff like that. And uh, so w I've, I've enjoyed it thoroughly, and um, I, I know what it, goes, uh, what it takes to put on a meeting like this. There's a lot goes on behind the scenes and resources and time and energy and effort. And so uh, I really do appreciate it, and uh, you've been a gracious host to us <clears throat> this, uh, this weekend. Jesus paid it all. Amen. That was a wonderful song. I've loved the music all, all weekend. I think music's important. I really do, and I think it needs to be done in a God-edifying and uh, in, in glorifying way. Uh, but Jesus paid it all. Sometimes I think back, uh, you know, I'm 36 years old. My life spiritually really turned on a dime uh, roughly 10, 11 years ago. And so hearing that song uh, really does something in my heart uh, about the grace of God. And I'm telling you, 10 years ago, I wouldn't be right here where I'm at had it not been for God's grace, the blood of Christ. I'm thankful for this, this meeting. Um, it's been good. I feel like praying and just going and eat. <laughs> but I'm going to preach a little bit while I'm here, amen. I'm not going to keep you too long. I am going to look at the time. I do want to show you a thing or two here from God's Word before we uh, get there. I do want you to... Uh, look here at the screen just so you can get a little more information on us. I do appreciate Brother David. He gets uh, a little bit of the uh, royalties for visitors we have because he sends them our way. Uh, when people are looking for churches in the North Georgia area, uh, they'll contact him. And, and so we've had several people uh, join the church, and uh, one of which is a Sunday school teacher there, and I mean plugged in, and, and I do appreciate my brother, uh, Eric, is, uh, uh, was a missionary to India for over 10 years, and so he is our associate pastor now, so he's filling in, so I do appreciate him uh, being there, but uh, this is the L. Rod family. I did outkick my coverage when it comes to my wife, and uh, she married me back when I had hair, uh, so uh, anyway, but she stuck with me now, and her name's Samantha, and uh, she is a graduate of the University of Georgia. I knew I'd get an amen right there, right? Uh, she's originally from Texas, and, and we actually met after we both graduated from college, and uh, we still get to visit her family. Her family lives out there outside the Dallas area, and uh, so that's, you've seen uh, Landry and Lawton here, and uh, the boss man is the one right there uh, flying solo. That's Lucas, and uh, he runs the show most of the time at the house. He just turned two. Uh, in, uh, in September, but uh, that's our family. Uh, the next few, if y'all just want to roll through those pretty quick, this is a pictures of our church there. Uh, very blessed, and I know it's not about facilities. This is a beautiful facility. This is a fantastic facility that you've got. I love the addition and all the things there. That's wonderful. Uh, it's a good, good thing to have places to go to, and so you're very fortunate. We're very fortunate uh, where we're at there on that hill. Uh, that's a picture of our fellowship. Paul, if you would go to the next one. Uh, there, right there at the front, 
we're up on a hill, and uh, it's, it's pretty incredible. We have a, a sunrise service on Easter Sunday, and you can look out, and the sun is popping over the mountains, and you're looking out across there. It's really a beautiful scene uh, to behold there, but we're very blessed. I've uh, been at Salem Baptist Church. It'll be seven years this February, and so uh, when we started there, uh, took the church. At the time, the church was part of the Southern Baptist Convention in name, not really any type of affiliation as far as uh, the ins and outs of it. And uh, through God's grace and His mercy, we were able to, uh, to transition out of that and uh, become independent, uh, which if you know anything about what you have to go through that, uh, it was not an easy task. But here's how it was able to happen. God's grace and people being open to the truth. Yeah. And that's what you've heard this weekend. That's what David's nailed home. That's what Eric and, and Stephen and Chase, it's, it's about the truth. And I'm telling you, something special when you get a group of people, I don't care how many that there are, a group of people that are committed and they want the truth and they're going to follow that through and stay with it. Yeah. It's all about the truth. And so uh, that's, uh, that's the inside of our church there. And uh, so we're, we're blessed facility-wise, but uh, I get to pastor a good group of people uh, that love Love God, they love each other, and, uh, and so we're trying to do something for the glory of God there in Calhoun, Georgia. Ezekiel chapter 14, here on the next slide, that's what we discussed last night about this certain corruption, and I'm not going to rehash that. Uh, if you want to take a picture of that, you can, or go back and listen to that on YouTube. But there were three men, as we saw in the book of Jude, Jude uh, in verse number 11, uh, that was the embodiment of this mystery of iniquity working out in an example for us. You had Cain, you had Balaam, and you had Korah. And so the world, the flesh, and the devil, we talked about how that religion, riches, and rebellion uh, was manifested in their lives. And so you and I, we have to still be aware, even though that we're saved on our way to heaven, the mystery of iniquity doth already work, and we have to be vigilant, we need to be sober, uh, we've got to be mindful of these things as we try to live out our Christian experience all for the glory of God. This morning, I want to talk to you about certain continuing, certain continuing. So just as sure as we saw three examples of what we need to be aware of and not doing, we also have three examples of uh, guys doing it right and, and going with the right stuff. And so there is certainly uh, a, a lot to learn, and, and you could take each one of these men and do a character study and, and talk a lot about them, but we're just going to skim the surface here. Ezekiel chapter 14, and look there in verse number 12. Now, the number three in your Bible is about completeness. So as those three were, were the uh, manifestation of completeness of, of evil and wrongdoing, you see this about completeness in righteousness. And uh, there, what, a, what a contrast. Ezekiel chapter 14, look there in verse number 12. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by, trans, uh, excuse me, by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out my hand upon it, and will break the staff of uh, bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. Now, as we look into the book of Ezekiel, this again is about judging, about judgment. He's going to judge Israel and he's going to tell them. But you're going to see these men mentioned in the same verse a few times here. Look at verse number 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. God's saying, in this nation, the only three that I'd spare among you would be Noah, Daniel, and Job. Go to verse number 16. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters. They only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. Go down to verse number 20 again. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. So as you saw Cain, as you saw Balaam, and you saw Korah there in the book of Jude, now in the book of Ezekiel, we have Noah, we have Daniel, and we have Job. So the world, the flesh, and the devil, I want us to look at this morning the examples of these three men 
how the other three failed in that area, how you and I, by God's grace, by His Spirit, by His Word, can live a life pleasing unto Him as ambassadors, as soldiers here in this warfare that we find ourselves in. And so we're going to see this example working out. Now, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, you can leave Ezekiel, but just keep those three in your thinking. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3, and let's look here in verse number 8. Second Timothy 3, 8. Paul says, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience. Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, Paul, as, as you've already heard in some of these uh, scriptures here this weekend, we are certainly living in the last days. Perilous times are here. And we certainly know in verse number 13, it's going to get worse and worse through deception. But in verse number 14, here is what we are to do in the midst of this deception in these perilous times. It's not time to just sit on our blessed assurance and wait for Jesus to come. That's not the attitude that God would have us to have, and that's not the attitude that the Apostle Paul had. He says, but in contrast of what we just read but continue, I want you to underline or underscore that there in your Bible. That's going to be the focal point of the message this morning about certain continuing. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. I like how Paul says, let every man be persuaded in his own mind. I think there's some things in this life we absolutely need to be certain about. First of which, we need to be certain about salvation. There was a time in my life when I was not certain about my salvation. And I can tell you this, it was an absolute prison. I lived in a state of continual doubt. I was up one minute, down the next, and usually it based upon my circumstances and how I was doing at the time. I was living right, and y'all know what I mean by that. I thought what I was doing was righteous, and I was going about, and everything was going good. I feel saved. I must be saved. Well, then I would sin, or things would go bad, and my goodness, I must be lost. And I was up, I was down, I was, I was uh, confused as a termite in a yo-yo. That was my spiritual existence. And listen, a lot of the time, I was doing it to myself, but here's the kicker. There was a lot of times pastors were doing that to me too. I mean, they'd get up one minute and talk about the free gift of God. There's nothing you can do to earn it, keep it, or anything else like that. And then in the next sermon, they'd preach something about works or to how you can prove that you're saved. And all these things, and it, was, it, it began to, to get in my thinking. It would confuse me. Listen, I think a lot of people are very sincere. I think there's a lot of saved people out there that struggle with this area of assurance. I believe that. What a miserable state to be in. God doesn't want you to be that way. He wants you to know. Paul says that we can be assured of, assured of knowing. Listen, I think we need to be sure about our salvation. I think we need to be sure about the scriptures. I'm glad. One thing that immediately struck me about Brother David even before I came to the knowledge of uh, understanding right division, there was never any doubt in my own personal thinking that the King James Bible is the Word of God. Not one, not one time in my... Listen, I've never even owned another Bible other than the King James. And I didn't know anything about the Texas Receptus, and I didn't know anything about the men that were on the translating committee. I didn't know anything about the methods by which they used. And listen, that's all wonderful stuff. I just believe that this is the book that I have in my hands. Listen, I think you need to be certain about that. I don't think there needs to be any doubt in your own thinking, in your own mind about what you've got. 
And I think we need to be certain about our service. We need to be certain about our service. Real quick, I want you to take your Bible. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is introduction. The message is going to be a lot shorter than the introduction, okay? It has been good for me going through and preaching verse by verse through the book of Romans. I've preached a lot from the book of Romans, but I've never went verse by verse through the book of Romans. And I'm telling you, Romans 14 and 15, especially Romans 14, I'm talking about things being certain, and I think most things in our life, it needs to be certain. There is an area we understand about Christian liberty. In Romans 14, about not judging those that are weak in the faith and, and, and all that comes around that. But listen, we better make sure we've got some things nailed down in this life. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look at verse number 24. Paul says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all. I can still see this. And some of you Georgia Bulldog fans will know what I'm talking about. I remember this. It became the catchphrase in every high school in America. Had it, well, maybe not in America, but at least maybe in the South, in, in the state of Georgia. You remember Mark Rick uh, came up with the phrase, I don't know if he came up with it, but it was finish the drill. Do y'all remember that? I do. We had it on our T-shirts. We thought that was pretty cool, right? Finish the drill. Well, they say, don't run to the line, run through the line, right? There's a difference. So Paul, as he says, look, know ye not that they which run in a race run all. We're talking about this life that you and I live. We're talking about we need to continue. Now, you're in a good place right now. I mean, you're here uh, in Jackson. Is it Jackson or Locust Grove? I messed it up last time. I'm going to Jackson. There you go. <laughs> We're here. We're not going to mess around, though. Okay. <laughs> We're in Jackson, Georgia. Hey, you're in a good place. You're in a Bible-believing church on a Sunday morning in Jackson, Georgia. That, hey, that's a great place to be, amen? He says, they run a race, run in a race, run all, but one receiveth the prize. So you run in a race, and we talked about this morning about some guys that, that we knew down there in Florida that were fast and stuff like that. Listen, you run, but at the end of that thing, they're only crowning one of them as being first place. Right? So Paul says, So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Here the last few years, we sold our house. My wife and I, we sold our house uh, it's, it may, maybe three years ago now. I can't remember. I've slept since then. But we sold our house and uh, we, we were looking to get closer to our church and where I work and various things like that. And uh, so we moved in with my parents, we moved into their basement, and then uh, we actually moved in to the parsonage there at the, uh, at the church, uh, which was a great blessing. And so uh, that's where we live now. But when we moved in the first time, uh, there was some damage underneath the floor. There was uh, water damage. And what turned out to be something that we thought would be just a few weeks turned into a year. The more that they began to, to pull that floor out, the more issues that they found. So we move in, was there for about a month, and we move back out with my parents for a year. Now, you talk about strengthening a marriage. <laughs> if we were going to get divorced, it would have been over the last two years, okay? You move in, you move out, you got pods uh, putting your stuff in there, you got insurance. You get, I mean, man, I'm telling you, it's been, it's been crazy. Praise the Lord, we're back in now. We're on a good foundation, literally, and all these other things. But as we were moving stuff around, my mom, she's one of those that, that saved everything. That second grade penmanship award that you got that's collected dust and it's moved 15 times, don't you dare throw that thing away. And all the other rec ball, you know, trophies. Back in my day, we didn't have travel ball. You played rec ball, amen? Amen. They were the best of times. They were the worst of times. But all the rec ball trophies and these medals and all this stuff, right? So she made me take it with me when we moved. So I've, I've moved this stuff a few times. Well, this last time, it got moved never to return again. 
we put that thing uh, in a, a dumpster, or I did. I didn't tell her about it, and I hope she's not watching. She should be in church. <laughs> but you know what that stuff was? It was corruptible. A lot of it had faded. It had scratches. It, it's dusty. It was cheap is what it was. Unless I'm not telling you to take your kid's stuff and go throw it in the garbage, okay? They can do it when they get in their 30s if they want to. <laughs> but what I'm telling you is, our society, we are so programmed and pressured to chase corruptible crowns. Paul says, you're missing it. You're missing it. Don't chase the corruptible crown. He says, but we... An incorruptible. Well, since you're going to be doing that, Paul, what should you do? He says, I therefore so run. Paul says, I'm going to run. Because there's an incorruptible crown out there that there's a possibility can be mine. All for the glory of God. He says, not as uncertainly. Remember, we're talking about certain continuing. Not as uncertainly. So fight I... Not as one that beateth the air. Paul says, I'm not just out here swinging and hoping I connect. That's how that I lived the vast majority of my Christian experience before I came to the knowledge of right divine, the word of truth. Y'all have heard this before. I'm trying to find the will of God. Well, good luck finding it on your own. You're out there. You, that's what you're, yeah, you're trying to find it. Where is it? Well, it's found in the pages of Scripture. It's right there. There it is, right? So we don't do that uncertainly. We know exactly where it is, and we know exactly what the will of God is concerning us in the dispensation of the grace of God. He says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. You know what Paul's saying right here? He's not talking about losing his salvation and being a castaway either. He's talking about what David has mentioned already about being ashamed at the judgment seat of Christ. Not being approved in that day. And so what he's saying is, we need to continue in the race. Continue in the race. Now, Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11. Stay with me. We'll move fast through this. I want you to see some examples here about men that continued. Men that continued. Hebrews chapter number 11. The first example we see of Noah. Now you can read about Noah over there in Genesis chapter 6. You know the condition that he found himself in in a world filled with corruption and violence. The thought of man's heart was only evil continually. That's what the Bible tells us. Now Hebrews chapter number 11 and look there in verse number 7. Hebrews eleven seven. By faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. Noah receives revelation from God about something that has never happened before. Moves with fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Prepared. Noah is an example of preparation. He says he prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the what world there it is Noah overcomes the world now you got to think about the world that Noah lived in too now we know the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually but you also know what was going on back there with the sons of God you talk about a strange day that he found himself in and receiving a message of rain now, we were talking, I was talking with someone uh, just yesterday. I said, we need some rain. I don't know if y'all have got much down here, but we had not hardly got any up there in Canaan land. <laughs> Blairsville, amen. I'm on my way, amen. <laughs> but we had not got much rain. We need some. Imagine preaching a message of rain, not only rain, but a flood, for 1,600 years of human history had never happened before. That'd be a strange thing, wouldn't it? But you'd have to believe that by faith, wouldn't you? And so he's out there and he's preaching this message, and we certainly know that the world did not receive his message. 
But you know, the rain came in spite of the scoffers. Now, I am a creature of habit. I really am. And I know everybody's different. I like doing things a certain way. And I usually like doing things the way I'm supposed to, uh, uh, not necessarily what I'm supposed to do, but how I think they should be done, right? Some people say a guy I used to work for, he said, there's the right way, there's the wrong way, and then there's my way, right? So every day, Noah getting up, driving the nails and constructing that ark. And as he's working, he's warning people at the same time. What's he warning them? He's going to send the flood. The flood's coming. The rain's coming. Now, how would you like to preach the same message for 120 years? You'd probably have that one down. You probably, I, I doubt by the time he got, uh, got about 10 or 15 years in, he probably didn't need the outline anymore, did he? <laughs> he knew the message. But that was the message that God gave him. You know what he did? He continued. He continued. Noah, we've heard that one before. Yeah, but the rain's coming. Noah, what else you got for us that's new? I got the rain's coming. Who told you that? God said. What's he going to do? He's going to wipe you out unless you get in the ark. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? That's the Jesus that doesn't get preached very much. The rain came in spite of the scoffer. The rain came in spite of the scientist. Amen? They're going to out, out educate God. Some people are educated far beyond their intelligence. That's their problem. The rain came. You say this guy, and I always have to preface this. I don't believe in everything Peter Ruckman did. He believed the book, and I appreciate it. He was right on a lot of stuff. But I've heard him say this before. Science will always be about 1,500 years to 2,000 years behind the Bible, and he's right. Science, they'll, hey, they're always a day late and a dollar short, according to this book. The rain came in spite of the scientists. Hey, the rain came in spite of the sanctimonious. What I mean by that? There's people that believe that God's too loving to send anybody to hell. There's even people in the so-called grace movement that have explained away eternal judgment in the lake of fire. Woe be unto them. They have gone the way we talked about last night. I'm here to tell you, salvation's free, friends. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God commended His love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. All those scriptures are 100% true, but this is also true. If you die without receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you'll burn forever in a literal lake of fire. And it doesn't matter what the feel-good preachers of our day say, it's still going to happen. Noah, what are you going to do? Noah said, I'm going to prepare. Are you prepared this morning? Are you prepared to meet God? The only way you can be prepared to meet God is trust the one that he sent to die for your sins was buried and rose again. Are we prepared in the ministry? Look what he says. He says, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Eric, I think you mentioned this again as I was driving down yesterday. One of you mentioned it. I can't remember. I think it was Eric, but... I get to preach to people every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, in a crowd like this. We're on YouTube. We don't have the following that, that David does. But there's people that tune into the messages, and, and, and I'll, I'll probably never meet most of them on this side of eternity. And I don't know how many of them are saved or will be saved by listening to what we're saying. I don't know that, and you don't know that either. But I do know this, they're going to spend eternity somewhere. And I want everybody to be saved, don't you? I really do. And I know God can. He saves me. And y'all don't know me very well, but I know me very well. And listen, if all the world rejects what I'm preaching, that's going to be a burden and that would be a tragedy. But you know what would be worse in my estimation? If them two right there and the ones that you saw on that screen 
Can you imagine spending eternity without your family? Hey, I'm glad my boys, these two were here. I miss my wife. I miss her right now. I miss my two-year-old. I miss them right now. I, hey, I love y'all. Don't get offended, but I'm leaving here in a little bit. <laughs> hey, I love my family. Noah loved his family. Prepared an ark to the saving of his house. I said this to our church not long ago. I said, my number one ministry is not the ministries of Salem Baptist Church. And it's not. My number one ministry is my family. I said, because let's be honest. Y'all could get mad and blow up on me and throw me off this hill. We live, or we're, our church is on a big hill. Y'all throw me off this hill. I said, you know who's going to scoop me up at the bottom over there in the ditch? My wife and kids. Hey, church, hey, people in here might turn their back on you. Get your family in the ark, folks. Amen. Get them in. Now, they got to make the choice. He didn't take his boys by the hand and say, I'm forcing you on here. But listen to me. We got we to gotta tell them. We got to plead with them. We got to make it real to them. This thing is real now. This isn't Mickey Mouse Clubhouse stuff. This is eternal life, heaven or hell this morning. Noah made preparations. Number two, look at Daniel. Go to Daniel chapter number one. Example of preparation. I'm not going to have you turn there, but jot these verses down. 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul tells you that you and I, he says in a great house there's vessels of honor and of dishonor. Talked about purging ourselves. Why? To be prepared, a vessel of honor prepared unto every good work. Hey, you know a very simple thing, and I was going to bring one. I don't even have one on my left. Well, I left it at the hotel room. You walk out the door. There's tracks right there. There's tracks out there before you leave. Hey, grab one today. Now, you may, you're going to probably come over here to eat, but most Sundays you may go down to the restaurant. Leave a track with a waitress. You're going to get gas, aren't you? Instead of sit, sitting there and, uh, you know, getting blowed up. I love the... Uh, <laughs> I'd say this, if y'all get mad, I mean, I'm going to be leaving here a little bit, but uh, the, the Joe Biden sticker, I did that. Have y'all seen those? That was pretty funny. It kind of lightens up when you're having to pay all this money for gas. You can see that and kind of get a laugh out of it anyway, but, and he did, he did. But uh, leave a gospel track right there. You're pumping gas, somebody's on the other side. You ain't got to give them a dissertation on everything there is in the Bible. Hey, hey. I'd like to leave this with you. Salvation by Jesus Christ. Read this right here. Contact information is on the back. If you've got questions, our pastor's there. Uh, his contact information. But I'm going to leave this with you. Hey, if you'll take two minutes and read this, it might change your life for all of eternity. I'm praying for you. And then going about your business. But you know what you've got to have to have that mindset? You've got to be prepared for that stuff. You've got to be prepared for that stuff. I just preached a message out of Romans 15 about one mind and one mouth. You know where it says over there? You know what we think. That's why he says mind first, and then he says our mouth, glorifying God. You know the reason a lot of times we don't think about inviting people to church or we don't think about giving the gospel? Or let me back up rather. The reason we don't do it verbally, because it's not in our mind to begin with. We're not thinking about it. You know what we're thinking about? We're thinking about everything else under the sun except what we should be doing. We're, we're cumbered about with much serving. We got too many irons in the fire most of the time, folks. Hey, I got to go. I, hey, listen, y'all don't know what I do for a living, but I promise you, I know how it is. I know how it is. Work a full time job, pastor a church, coach two different rec teams. And listen, everything else in between. I'm not telling you that to say, look at me. I'm telling you that I know how it is. We get caught up in doing so much that we miss the main thing. The main thing is seeing sinners being saved by the grace of God. How are they going to be saved? You're going to have to tell them. I'm going to have to tell them. The public school's not telling them. The federal government's not going to tell them. The entertainment industry's not going to tell them. Amen? Who's going to tell them? we got to tell them. Daniel chapter number 1. Daniel is an example of purpose. 
purpose. Look what he says here in verse number 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portions of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. You know what Daniel had before he ever got to Babylon? Daniel had already purposed it in his heart. I'm not going to do what they're going to try to get me to do when I get there. You know what you need to do? There needs to be some solid foundations in your inner man and thinking about things in your life so before something ever pops up down the road and it will pop up at some point that the decision was made a long time ago so when you get to that situation it's going to be easy working in public school I can tell you this people say this phrase all the time well that's not a mountain or that's not a hill to die on you ever heard that before you know what it's, it, it, listen, it's not up to me to tell you what your hill needs to be. Let every man be persuaded in his own mind. But I know this, there's things that I've already decided on years ago when I've talked with my wife about, I'll say, hey, if this gets to this point and I'm faced with this situation on my job, I'm going to go back to firing the weed eater up and I'll go cut grass for a living because I will not do it. That's what people do. They'll say, well, you'll lose your job. Well, fire me tomorrow, but I'm not calling a girl a boy. Amen. Period. Amen. Not happening. There's some other things, heels that I'm going to die on. Listen, mine don't have to be yours, but here's what I'm here to tell you. You better purpose it in your heart. You better find out what they are right now. Because the days that we live in, what David put on that screen, he, he listed uh, what it's going to cost you. That seventh one, I think it was seven. Did you plan that out about spiritual perfection in seven? You did, didn't you? Well, I knew you used to be a Baptist and having outlines like that. Amen. It may cost you your life. Hey, we're heading there. Think about how crazy the last ten years have been. And how rapid, I was having a conversation uh, this morning about how fast things have been moving. Think about how fast they're going to move the next 10 years. Make decisions today. Young people, make the decision today. I love the book of Daniel. Daniel was a young man. We don't know exactly how old he was. He wasn't a toddler, but I don't think he was in his mid-20s either. But he was a young man, purposing in his heart. Listen, you don't have to go out and live for Babylon. You don't have to do that. And listen, I'll tell you what else he found out. Mom and daddy wasn't around anymore. Mom and daddy wasn't around. Hey, young person, at some point, it's got to be your convictions and not just mom and dad's. Praise God, mom and dad brought you here. You're in a good church. Or are you going to be in one 20 years from now? That's your conviction. That's got to be your choice. Daniel, about purpose. We've got a purpose in our heart. And finally this morning, you see an example of patience. I want you to go to the book of James. The book of James. Now, James talks about, Job. well, two, two, uh, two places. Go to Job 23 in one hand and go to James 5 in the other. Let's start in James 5. By the way, when I say that, I, I, I truly mean that. There's things that you, you are going to have to decide on your own, and it's not up to me to judge those things. The Lord's the judge. I'm just simply saying, there's going to be situations on your job. I know some people that have lost their job. Not even for having a Bible on their desk. You say, where'd that happen at? It wasn't in China. It's in the buckle of the Bible belt. Some loudmouth reprobate on their job got convicted because there was a Bible on somebody's desk. Caused a stir, and then you got people in leadership that don't have any type of a backbone to say, we're, the, we're leaving the Bible on the desk. If that bothers you, you need to go somewhere else and work. My name is Drew Elrod, and I'm running for president. 
You won't hear one talk like that, will you? You know what they'll do? They'll cave to the mob, won't they? Now, that's their choice. That's their choice. I'm simply saying that's where the rubber is going to meet the road for you in a situation. Get that thing nailed down. Get it figured out before it gets to that place. James chapter 5. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Noah condemned the world, became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Daniel purposed it in his heart. He overcame his flesh. He said, I'm not defiling my flesh. I'm not going to treat my body like an amusement park. Listen, our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost of God. God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands today. You know where he's at? He's in the believers. He's dwelling in you. He sealed you. You're bought with a price. You're not your own. Glorify God where? In your body. In your body. Job. You know what the situation he had with the devil. James 5 tells us this. Verse number 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. 2 Timothy chapter 4 says that they will not endure sound doctrine in the last days. He says, Behold, we count them happy which endure, which have, uh, ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Back up to verse number 10. I meant to start in verse number 10. Look what he says. Take my brother the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord. Here it is. For an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Job 23, and I'm done. Job chapter 23. Romans 5 tells us that, about this, about patience. Patience, experience, experience, hope. Hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Ghost. You know what you got to have to finish a race? You better, you better be patient. When I was in school, I was pretty fast. If you don't believe me, me and David will have a foot race <laughs> after the service. That would be good. You know a good fundraiser after I leave? Get all the preachers together and get them to race in the parking lot. And you can take up an offering for world evangelism. That would be pretty good, wouldn't it? But I was. I played, uh, I played quarterback uh, all through uh, uh, football in college, and we ran the triple option. Y'all remember what the triple option was? Yeah, that's what I did. I was a, I was a glorified uh, uh, running back that played quarterback. I could throw it a little bit, but I, I, I was fast. I could run. And conditioning never bothered me. I would go out there and run. I mean, 100, 200, 40s. I, I was a sprinter. So days when we had to condition, we had to run sprints, I didn't moan and groan. It didn't bother me one bit. Let's get in here, let's get it done, and, and we'll, get, we'll, we'll go to the house. I hated running long distance. I got bored. I got winded. I just didn't like it. I still don't like it. That's why I don't do it anymore. <laughs> Nobody's forcing me to, amen. But you know what you got to have? you got to have patience to do that stuff, don't you? You're going around that track. You're going around and around and around and around. Patience. You know what we've got to have in the Christian life? We've got to have patience. Can I say this? I'm so glad that there has been people that have been patient with me. My parents were so patient with me. Now they, uh, my dad was a Proverbs 22, 15 dad. Look that up here in just a little bit. Proverbs 23, 13 through 15. He liked those verses too. But patient. Even when I was coming to the knowledge of the truth, having guys like David, having some friends in the ministry that were patient, showing me things. My goodness, I know the church that I pastor, they were patient and they're still patient with me. Patient. Not everybody's at the same place as you are in the Christian life. You know what you need to be with people? 
patient. You know the ultimate example in who's patient with us? God's so patient with us, isn't he? Boy, he's so long-suffering with us. Look what Job says. Job 23, and I'm done. Verse number, verse number 8. Behold, I go forward. But he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. Job's trying to get a grip on where God is. Hey, Job's right in the middle of this thing, isn't he? Man, he's confused. You ever been there? Sure you have. On the left hand where he doth work, uh, but I cannot behold him. He hides himself on the right hand. I cannot see him. Job says, I can't see him. I can't perceive him. God, where are you at? Verse 10, but. You know what that is? That's doing right. Walking right. And everything you know to be right, listen, in spite of your circumstances and your feelings. That's a, listen, you can't do that in your own power and strength. But you can through God. Man, there's going to be times when everything around you, the circumstances of life, and they are coming. Some of you may be in them right now. And buddy, they're real. Job was in one right here. And you're feeling, and you're searching, and you're like, my goodness, it seems like God's a million miles away. Now here's the answer. But, I love this right here. He, that's God, knoweth the way that I take. Lord, bless your heart. God hadn't forgot about you. But he knows exactly where you're at right now. And I know it's in the book of Hebrews, but I'm still thankful for it. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Aren't you glad that the Son of God became a Son of Man? Yeah. Identifying with us in our humanity, in our circumstances, in everything else that we face. And that's why we've got an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Man, he knows where we're at. Look what he goes on to say. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Whew. Continue. Job, he came forth as gold too, didn't he? Sure did. Patience. Patience. My foot hath held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Now here's where it's going to be and I'm done. I really mean it on the third time I say I'm done, okay? <laughs> Job says, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. My goodness, how often have you heard that this weekend? What made the difference, Job? The Word of God. <laughs> Brother David, you come on around. I'm going to show you this, and again, this isn't a, this isn't a brag. But I mean what I told you earlier. I doubted my salvation so bad. I would be up at night and I'd be on my knees and I'd just be crying. I would go throughout my day just plagued in my mind. Walking around, carrying out my daily tasks. And in my mind, it was warring against my mind. I know what that's about. You know what I had to come to realize? I'm going to try to forget and unlearn everything I've ever heard a preacher or a church teach me. And I'm going to let God be the authority through his word. And I spent so much time in this book right here in Romans 3, 4, and 5. Now, I told you I'm a creature of habit. I can't stand, I say, I don't need to say it that way. I see stuff on the page. I preach out of this Bible right here. I know where stuff's at. You throw me a different Bible, it's, it's, it's like I'm looking at a different thing. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm not telling you that's right. I'm just telling you it's so. But I spent so much time in Romans 3, 4, and 5, and I had to let Romans 3, 4, and 5 so get into my thinking and transform my thinking from the inside out that this came slap out of my Bible. And now I have to tuck it back here. You know, people call us Bible choppers. That's not what I did right there, okay? I tell you that for this reason. 
the only thing that helped me was that right there. Amen. When I get, listen, I couldn't perceive God. I couldn't see Him. I could, none of that was helping. Miserable comforters like Job had, I had them too. They didn't help. They made it worse. But buddy, when I got a good grip of Romans 3, 4, and 5, assurance came, confidence Amen. came, and I don't care if, if, if Gabriel, the archangel, dropped out of heaven right now, stood right here in front of me and said, you're dying and going to hell, I'd say you're a liar and the truth's not in you. Amen. Saved, saved, saved. Amen. By the grace of God, amen. 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 Continue. Hey, you're here today. Lord willing, I can be here again next year if David would have me. And I hope I see you again. But if I don't see you here, I'll see you there. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace. God, we're thankful for your love. God, how you displayed that love on a hill called Calvary 2,000 years ago. For time and eternity, nailing down the payment of our sin. Sending your son, him willingly going to the cross, paying all of our sin, being buried and raised again on the third day without our sin to justification. What a glorious message that we get to preach. God, I pray this morning, if there's some that's been on the fence about salvation, I pray that they'd get it settled. God, I pray those that have trusted Christ, that they would have that great and blessed assurance. God, I pray for this dear church. I pray that you'd help them minister right where they're at here. God, I pray as their ministry goes online in various places, God, I pray that you'd bless them for it, show them great favor. God, I pray for those that have traveled here. I count it an honor and blessing to meet them. Pray that you'd help them right where they're at. Strengthen us together, God, through your word, uh, that we can be a better Christian. Uh, God, not for ourselves, but to see souls saved, to, be center, uh, to see saints built up in the faith, see those that are downtrodden and uh, encouraged, uh, God, in the Lord, here in these last days. God, all these things that you're going to do in us, through us, and for us, We'll give you the praise, honor, and glory. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.